We're going to talk about the job of a woman this morning and the mother. And we appreciate all of our mothers. <clears throat> and I'm going to read this in Titus. You don't have to turn there, but it's in Titus 2, and it starts with verse 3. And it says, and Paul is talking to Titus, who was a pastor. And he was telling Titus, tell the older women to behave as those who love the Lord, as, the, as those who love the Lord should. Uh, they must not gossip about others or be slaves of wine. They must teach what is proper so the younger women will be loving wives and mothers. Each of the younger women must be sensible and kind as well as good homemakers who puts her own husband first. Uh, then no one can say insulting things about God's message. Now, you know, you never know who is watching you. I know many of your mothers out here think, well, you have your uh, own children. But, you know, many of you, especially the older women, they are mothers to younger women. And they're looking at you because they might not have had an example at home. And you may be the only example that they see. And uh, I want to read this, uh, a card that uh, someone sent to Susan. And it reads like this. You're like a mother to me. Dear Susan, over the years I looked to you many times for the correct ways to mother my children. Well, what a powerful statement this uh, young woman made with these kids. I happen to know that this person had four children. I took to heart the special things you showed on how to teach and train our children to become productive, God-fearing, and God-loving uh, uh, grown-ups. I wanted to say thanks because you instilled in me a strong belief that we as mothers can make a difference in the lives of our children. If we train up our children in the ways of the Lord, when they are old, they will not depart from it. And over the years, you were like a mom to me, and uh, even a spiritual mom as well. Thank you for your, prop, your, your prayers, your example over the years, and for believing in me. And uh, this woman wrote that to Susan. And uh, so we need, to, we need to remember that. Now, your own children are looking at you. And I want to help you mothers a little bit this morning and uh, maybe to help you to realize really the position that God has put you in. And it's really a tremendous place that God has entrusted to you. We read Proverbs 31, which is a tremendous um, uh, verses of scripture. And I just wanna bring out some nuggets in Proverbs 31. It goes on and says, who can find a virtuous woman, strong in character, and moral excellence. Uh, it goes on, her price is far above rubies. She is worth more than precious gems. Now I want our husbands now to pay attention to me. All you husbands, look at me. Look at me right now. Your wives are mothers. And that's a hard place to be. Because she has a tremendous responsibility to keep the peace in the house, keep that house uh, organized and straight, and to nurture the kids that we gave her. And I don't know, I, as I've grown over the years, I've, I've, uh, I have come to this place with a deep respect for my wife because she has mothered my three children. And I have to be honest with you, she's mothered me because I needed some mothering too. Come on now. And I thank God for my wife because the woman has that unique way of, of nurturing and nurturing the children. But my goodness, have my, my wife nurtured me over the years. But that has caused me to respect her and to, to be gentle with her and to be kind to her. Now, I haven't always been, 
uh, kind. I, I, I have a background of uh, leadership, of a foreman, and uh, one thing that when God put a pastor heart in me, I had to quit, you know, just being so sharp and do this, do that, you know, and all that type of thing. I've had to realize that I had to be more kinder, more gentler to my wife and to my girls because I had three girls. But I appreciate the women. I appreciate the women in this church. I appreciate my wife. I appreciate my three girls. And I'm still able to share little nuggets with them. And they listen to their dad. And they love their dad. But boy, do they love their mother. Do they love their mother. I mean, quite a few years ago, I had, uh, when Susan and her and me were sitting out in the swing, and Susan passed out on me. I mean, she went out on a light just like that. And God spoke to me and said, start breathing life into her. I grabbed her, and I began to breathe life into her, and she came back to life just like that. I obeyed God. I didn't say, well, why, God? I moved, and I did it instantly and brought life back into her. And I called my oldest daughter up, and I said, get a hold of Tammy and Sandra. Uh, we're carrying your mom. 911, I called 911, ambulance is on their way to take Susan, your mom, to the hospital. And I'm telling you, on the other side of that phone, my daughter hollered out, and she said, not my mama, not my mama. She said, Dad, I'm going to fall to the floor. I said, honey, get to your knees right now. She said, my knees are coming out from under. I said, honey, listen, it's going to be all right. I started speaking life to her. She's going to make it. She's not going to die. I didn't know that but I spoke it by faith. I spoke life into her. I said, now, okay, it's going to be okay. They're coming now. now. You just called Tammy and Sandra. We're on our way to the hospital. Well, Susan is here. Amen. But see, I saw, I saw in my daughter how much my daughters love their mother. And uh, her grandchildren the same way. And so sometimes, you know, you're sitting out there, Mom, and you don't know just how much really your kids love you, but you're special. You're special. And uh, your kids love you. And you love your kids. But young people, tell your mother you love them now while she's alive. Now is the time to say, Mom, I love you, and I appreciate what you do. Because let me tell you something. Our mothers laid their lives down to bring us into the world. And so the woman has a high place in God's agenda. And us men, we need to really honor and, and, and love our wives as Christ loved the church and nurtured them. And I'm working at it every day myself. Susan, we've been married 53, and I'm sure that Susan got up and gave a testimony. She'd say, well, he was once, <laughs> but he has, God has gotten a hold of his heart, and he's more gentle to me now. He's more considerate about me now. And, you know, that does something to her, because that, in response, releases herself to me. This morning she looked at me in the eyes, and she said, honey, I love you. Well, I walked out of the house, yes, yes. But see, that's war. She watered me on the way over here, and we watered one another. Now, let me say this. The word daughter appears in the Bible more than 200 times, and daughter-in-law 20 times. The word granddaughter does not appear at all though grandmother is mentioned once. The words wife and wives appear in the Bible close to 400 times. The word mother appears uh, 20 times in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles and underlines the importance attached to the mothers of kings. You never know. That one that you're cradling in, in your arms may be the next president of the United States, may be uh, the next Billy Graham, or may be the next Oral Roberts, or the next pastor, or the next whatever. So we want to remember that. 
And look what it says. A mother is the Bible's most honored woman and her influence cannot be calculated. It is, it is so far reaching. It has been said the one who rocks the cradle rules the world. Years ago as a young teenager, I, I thank God for my mother. But you know, I had other mothers. I had other mothers that mothered me. And I want to share about Mrs. Catterton. Mrs. Catterton, uh, uh, her two sons, uh, Paul and Clarence, and we were teenagers uh, together. But I would come to their house, and I was always welcome at Mrs. Catterton's house. And I was 14 years old, and I was always looking for a free meal. <laughs> But you know what I remember about Mrs. Catterton? She took me in just like her, her two sons. When they ate, I knew I was going to eat. Because when she fed her boys, she fed Bob. And, uh, but she never complained. She never murmured. I remember she'd say, well, Bob, do you want a cup of coffee? Now, Mrs. Catterton had some type of a nervous thing about her. Her hand shook like this. You ever see anybody like that? I mean, it shook like this. And she'd pour that coffee, and she's coming across the room. Listen, with a, with a, with a saucer and that cup of coffee, and it's a rocket and a rolling. But I'm telling you, not one drop, not one drop fell out of that thing. And when she got to me, just like that, she set that thing in front of me, just calm right down. She said, there's Bob. I hope you enjoy that cup of coffee. Now, you know, they were poor. They didn't have real fancy food. Collards, I remember collards. I hated collards. <laughs> but I was hungry. But her, her countenance, her mannerism, her love, her freedom to, to whatever they had she was willing to share with me meant so much to me. And that nurtured me. That watered me. That done something for me. Now, I've seen Susan that way. You, uh, for those that have come to Susan's house, if your tea gets a little low, she's right there, and she'll make sure it, you want another glass of tea. She'll fill that thing up. Uh, she is one that, that, that shows hospitality, and she ministers to people and makes sure that you feel at home. And see, she only not only does that to strangers, but she does that to our family. And that's why our family loves to come back home to dad and mom's house. Yesterday, as I was preaching the funeral, and I was preaching from St. John 14, and Jesus said, in my father's house, it struck me, in my father's house, there is no evil. In my father's house, there is no sin. In my father's house, there is no argument and fussing. In my father's house, there is no poverty. In my father's house, there is no strive and no uh, uh, talking and beckering back. No, in my father's house, there is generosity. In my father's house, there is kindness. In my father's house, there is gentleness. In my father's house, there is love. In my father's house, there is a welcome mat saying, welcome, Bob. In my father's house is all that I ever will need, graciously given to me by my heavenly father who loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall have everlasting life. In my father's house, all is welcome. All is welcome at the table. Rick was talking about Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, that's the word, long word, Mephibosheth. Who am I to be welcomed into my father and mother's house? In this case, we're talking of the horizontal and the natural. A dog like me, who am I? But God doesn't see us that way. See, he sees us holy and blameless by what Jesus Christ did for us.